In our final video, I would like to talk to you about something called the integral of a function. Sometimes, for emphasis, the thing that I'm about to show you is called the indefinite integral of a function, to distinguish it from something else called the definite integral. We're going to state the definition of the indefinite integral. We're going to find a formula for the integrals of simple functions. And then we're going to use that idea to go back to our applied problems in motion. Historically, we have used position to find velocity and used velocity to find acceleration. But in this section, we're going to go backwards. We're going to use acceleration to find velocity, and we're going to use velocity to find position. Now, in the previous video, we noted that a function could and did have more than one antiderivative. For example, for the function f of x equals x squared, we gave two antiderivatives. One of them was x cubed over 3, and one of them was x cubed over 3 plus 1. Both of these were antiderivatives because when we take the derivative, constants like plus 1 vanish and don't have any influence on the result. The indefinite integral of a function is the description of all its antiderivatives. When we say this is the function's integral, we are saying that every antiderivative of f of x looks like this. Now the indefinite integral, usually referred to as the integral of f of x for short, is denoted in the following way. It's denoted by an integral symbol, which looks like a very elongated s. The function f of x is on the inside, and then the symbol dx is used to close. The dx symbol is not optional. You should see this as like an opening and closing parentheses. The elongated s tells you where the integral gets started, and the dx tells you where the integral concludes. The function f of x that you are integrating appears between those symbols. So don't be lazy and forget your dx. You gotta have it. Okay, so the beautiful thing about integrals is that they're extremely closely related to the antiderivatives which we've already studied. Suppose you have a function called f of x, and you know what one antiderivative of f of x looks like. Let's call that single known antiderivative capital F of x. Then if you want a description of all possible antiderivatives, You take your one known antiderivative and you add a plus c. What we are saying when we write this is that the antiderivatives of f of x are only different by an added constant. Let's scroll back to our example with x squared. We had one known antiderivative, x cubed over 3. The other valid antiderivative had the form x cubed over 3 plus the constant 1. And as it turns out, functions like this guy below are the only kinds of antiderivatives that little f can possess. Start with some basic simple antiderivative and then add a constant to the end. So using this theorem, let's go ahead and find first any antiderivative of 4x cubed, and then let's find the integral of 4x cubed. Now to find an antiderivative, I think I will go ahead and use the power rule formula for antiderivatives. 
which says increase the power by 1 and then divide by the increased power. That gives us x to the fourth as an antiderivative of f of x. So now they're asking me for the integral. Give me a description of all possible antiderivatives of little f. The description of all possible antiderivatives can be obtained by taking one antiderivative and adding a plus c. Any antiderivative has the format x to the fourth power plus a constant. Same thing is true for cosine. And if I wanted to find the integral of cosine, I would start by finding an antiderivative. An antiderivative of cosine is given by positive sine. So the integral of cosine is given by positive sine plus c, sine plus some unknown constant. This is the format of every possible antiderivative of cosine. We have an object, and this time we're given the object's velocity at any given time t. The velocity function is given by v of t equals t minus 1 squared. They say, suppose that the object's initial position is given by f of 0 equals 4. Find a function v of t that gives the object's position at any time t. So we're going to use the fact that position must be an antiderivative of velocity. Why? Because velocity is the derivative of position. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, first of all, rewrite this function v of t a little bit, and I'm going to try and find its integral. I'm going to try and give a description of all possible antiderivatives of v of t. And then I'm going to try and figure out which one of the antiderivatives is my position function. So here I'm going to write down the integral of v of t. And since the independent variable is t, I'm going to use the closing symbol dt. So for t squared, I'll increase the power by 1, divide by the increased power. For 2t, I'll increase the power by 1, and then divide by the increased power. The antiderivative of the constant 1 is equal to the linear function with slope 1. And then, because I'm dealing with an integral, the integral has a plus c for some added unknown constant. So the position function in this problem must have the format t cubed over 3 minus t squared plus t plus c. But what is the value of c for my particular question? The key to answering that question, the key to finding the value of c, is given right here. When they tell me the object's initial position, the initial position of the object, the position at t equals 0, is given by 4. So if I replace t with 0 in this equation, I know that the output should be 4. So if I simplify that, what's the c value? The data about the initial position tells me that the c value for my antiderivative should be 4. And therefore, my position function is given by t cubed over 3 minus t squared plus t plus 4. Let's do a slightly extended example. Suppose that this time what they tell me is the object's acceleration at time t. a of t equals cosine. So let's try and ladder our way up to finding the object's position. So 
Rather than try and do everything at once, the first thing that I'm going to try and do is find v of t. Find the velocity. The velocity is an antiderivative of acceleration. But which one is it? To answer that question, I'm going to start by writing down the integral of acceleration, writing down all possible antiderivatives. So the antiderivative of cosine is sine, and therefore the integral is sine plus c, sine plus some unknown constant. So what's the value of c for my particular velocity? I'm going to use the information given to me that the initial velocity was equal to negative 1. The object was moving in the backward direction when time first started. So I'm going to plug 0 into this expression and let negative 1 be the output. So what is my velocity? My velocity function is given by sine t minus 1. Now let's repeat the process to find the position. The position is also given by an antiderivative of velocity. So the position function also has the format negative cosine, the antiderivative of sine, minus t, the antiderivative of minus 1, plus c, some unknown constant. To figure out the value of c, let's use the data that the initial position was given by f of 0 equals 3. Now at this point, it may begin to see, seem like the output of the initial position is always the same thing as the c value, but that's not generally speaking true. For example, here, if I plug in t equals 0 and set the output equal to 3, cosine of 0 is equal to 1, so the negative would be minus 1. So if I solve this for c, I get 4. Therefore, my position function, based on this given in acceleration function and the data about the initial velocity and the initial position, I was able to climb my way back up to the position function. The position at any given time is equal to negative cosine t minus t plus 4. Isn't this kind of incredible? It really boggles my mind to think that we can have an object's acceleration at any time and its velocity and position at just one time and somehow from those pieces of data extrapolate the object's position at all times. That's wild to me. But this is the power of integrals and this is the kind of thing that you will be studying in Calculus 2. Integrals and in particular, how to calculate integrals of difficult products and quotients. This concludes today's material and this concludes the course. Today we talked about integrals, which is a description of all possible antiderivatives of a function and which could be used in particular to find velocity given an object's acceleration and to find position given an object's velocity. In this course, we looked at limits and we looked at derivatives Derivatives were used to measure rates of change, and they were used to find the slope of a tangent line. Uh, and in particular, they could be used to find locations where a graph was flat. Locations where a graph was flat usually corresponded to local maxes or local mins of the function, and therefore could be used to optimize a situation. But derivatives also had some slightly stranger applications. Uh, for example, the derivative could be used to find the tangent line, which was the same thing as a function's linear approximation. And so this could be used to extrapolate a function's value without necessarily having to plug 
an, any number into the original function, you could use a linear equation as a stand-in. We also did things like calculate limits using derivatives and calculate solutions to equations using derivatives.